So this will start and then we'll figure it out. Uh, it looks like we're already starting, so maybe I won't try to give an introduction except to say it's, 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 that's right. Let me, let me stand here so you, you can see me. Hey, Welcome. Okay. Good to see you, Barry. We're very honored to have Costa Spiros. He's been a dynamic uh, uh, part of, of the Chicago group. There's a group of about 20 people at all the universities in Chicago we have met for many years. Costa's had more new ideas probably than any angle, any other single person there, and they are in these books, and we'll get a flavor, we'll get a flavor of it. But um, even though he's not in Cook County right now, uh, he is, he's got lots of, lots of creative things which generalize and can include both Cook County in a broader global perspective. So thank you. Uh, please, please lead us on, and I'm sure we'll have a, a great, great discussion. Sounds great. Well, thank you, Professor Clark. Really appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you. What I want to do is I'm going to start out by sharing with you some thoughts about how did I engage in this type of scholarship. Well, uh, back in 2000 or so, so about 27 years ago, uh, I, I worked on a book that focused on um, state development in Chicago. And at the time, the book actually looked at three different state development projects in Chicago. One was the installation of light, a green field, uh, and the political economy of those projects as well as the impact on the neighborhood of Lakeview. And then uh, the construction of the new industry park at the time, uh, which actually uh, uh, in South Arbor Square, very close by the where you're at, just north of where you're at, and uh, the impact on the neighborhood there in South Arbor Square, and the construction of the United Center on the west side and the near west side. Uh, so the project, uh, the end of the project was on, again, the political economy as well as the uh, impact on the community, the ability of the community to respond to those uh, pressures. Uh, but one of the chapters, you know, chapter two, uh, actually entitled uh, From Urban Renewal to the City of Leisure. Uh, so for those of you who may be familiar, Urban Renewal was a program, a federal program, came out the Second World War as a way to revitalize aging cities. So the argument in that chapter, chapter two, was that there was this shift, that all of us shift from those efforts of uh, urban renewal to a new type of city called the city of Leisure. Uh, so the conclusion of that chapter kind of led me because of leisure and entertainment and recreation let me to start to think about cities more globally as well as how cities are able to observe how cities are redeveloping themselves and revitalizing themselves and I can observe uh, cities like Chicago, for example, it's gone through a tremendous infrastructure along the lakefront. Uh, and then, uh, so I completed this book on urban tools and urban change that I'm going to share with you some thoughts about in that project. Uh, subsequently, I focused on a book that came out a couple of years ago, Richard and Daly of Chicago, with a similar theme, Building the City of Spectacle, Richard and Daly and the Remaking of Chicago, and how the mayor, over a 27 year period, reorganized the city's economy and focusing on culture and uh, economic development. Uh, and currently, I'm working on a book which focuses on innovation districts, universities, and uh, structure in the city. Uh, and basically the rise of a new class of, uh, these are technology-based innovation districts that a lot of universities are, are pushing. Uh, it's not just the university that are doing that, there's a lot of the, a lot of the this government is often involved in that, and a lot of the private sector, you think of Seattle and Microsoft and that and so on. Uh, so this book that I'm working on has a similar theme of, you uh, uh, may have read about the creative class and they're getting much more complicated and nuanced approach to inviting young entrepreneurs that are coming in the city and, and, and the role that all comes into that. So I think that the reason I'm saying all this with you is because I just get a chance to keep my thinking along the way and how it has helped me evolve, even though at the core my area of interest has kind of remained consistently, though I am uh, engaging in various arguments and, and, and various topics along the way. Before I move forward, though, and share with you a little bit about this book on tourism, uh, I want to share with you that uh, Professor Clark, uh, and one who's done tremendous work over so many years, but uh, he has probably one of the most, uh, I believe, one of the most influential books or 
on the topic uh, uh, on the uh, and a tremendous title really the entertaining machine and he's absolutely right on that because cities are entertaining engines uh, and uh, uh, the city is an enter entertaining city entertaining machine is one of the most influential uh, this is a scholarship that has been very influential to me as well as many other scholars. So, I don't know if you've had a chance to read it in this class or a different class, but I think you'll find the arguments and the topic to be very, very relevant as cities are growing significant and considerable changes in front of us. So, with that in mind, what I'm going to do is we're going to shift to and I'm hoping that this will work. So, do you see the PowerPoint? Yes. yes. Okay, great, thank you. What I'll do is I'll talk to you about uh, this project, it's not the latest project, but in this one, I focus on uh, again, urban tourism and urban change, and uh, uh, has more of a global orientation to it. Uh, I took the photo, actually, for the cover of the book, and you may be familiar with it if you've gone downtown with this part of Millennium Park, and this is uh, uh, Crown Fountain. Uh, which is has turned out to be a tremendous attraction and a great success for the city, uh, drawing so many people, uh, especially during the summer months, everybody, uh, everybody's pulled into that space. It's really, of course, a farm itself is uh, very not traditional in terms of its structure and its orientation, but it does call upon people, it invites people to engage with, and it's a, it's a very popular uh, site, uh, especially with children and families. Uh, and it's brought something that I know Professor Clark and I, over the, our years that we lived in Chicago and observed the city, was really absent from the downtown area and, and uh, the, the city uh, center. So, what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about can you please so okay, my transition to this slide? Yes. 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 Yes? Okay, thank you. So one of the questions that comes up is that how does tourism emerge as a cultural development strategy? And clearly you have to look at the post-World War II era and the restructuring that took place in the 70s and the 80s because as things were looking for ways to redevelop or redefine themselves, uh, they started to look at, at alternatives. Uh, so it was not anymore the manufacturing uh, uh, driver, but rather uh, all of a sudden, we started to see in the 70s and 80s, and even more vibrantly in the 90s, we started to see support for uh, cultural industries that are becoming part of the economic development uh, uh, agenda. And with the cuts and increasing demand for leisure, uh, uh, business travel, certainly after the Second World War, intensified, uh, uh, so cultural and tourism become a developing industry. And when I say developing industry, it is actually part of the quest uh, that a lot of cities and a lot of municipal leaders are starting to look in their quest for economic development are interested in, in pursuing. So as a bit of time, the second bullet there, if you think about the Second World War, the post-Second War era, and the social changes, uh, including the rise of consumption, that was not uh, evident there before, that consumption is actually something that can be produced and sold and become available, as well as structural changes and the existing status of city. So for example, here I'm thinking about decentralization, the decline of the core and the quest for new alternatives or new directions. Uh, so you think about consumption or the production of consumption is something to be sold uh, and the uh, quest in the part of space for uh, a new direction or a new identity. So urbanization takes place and, and brings about a lot of decline though uh, become very important factors to give rise to tourism and cultural development strategy. Identify some of the other forces there, including industrialization, decentralization, globalization, and all these uh, first governments to revisit their economic development strategy. Along with it, it's not just the leisure, uh, just becomes, comes to the, you know, emerges, but rather it becomes a very powerful force. Uh, and if you look at it after the Second World War, uh, from the 20s to the 50s, to the 50s, leisure activity mostly meant that people are not at work. So people pick a week off or two weeks off and we stay at home. But as we move after the Second World War, leisure becomes, there's an active element to it. Uh, so it's, uh, it's one of those things where a lot of times when we travel uh, and go into a place, you try to take everything in, take every possible tour. And there's a lot of factors, sociological factors, that are contributing to the rise of leisure. 
including the rise of uh, increase in disposable income, levels of education, the availability of leisure time, uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, the legitimate capacity to active leisure, uh, commodifying community and organization of middle class lifestyle, uh, so the professionalization of the travel industry, the rise of business travel, uh, uh, even the rise of the fast food industry and convention activities and the falling cost of travel, all of those contributed to giving rise to leisure in a very, in a very active and a very robust part of our economy. But there's a number of developments, including the rise of historic preservation movement, uh, new districts, more national parks, more monuments, historic areas to be visited. With suburbanization comes a sense of nostalgia for the old, for the old neighborhoods, even rise to day trippers. If you look for Chicago, for example, you find that the significant number of the majority of visitors to Chicago, to the city itself, are suburbanites, as well as people from the surrounding area. Though in recent years we've seen international travel increasing. So as a result of it, we see that local policymakers shift their orientation from service providers to active participants in local economic affairs. Now, again, if you look at this, you can see the decline of manufacturing, obviously, after the 1950s, post-World War II, and the need for new areas or new direction uh, and new sources of, of revenue uh, for municipal leaders. The other thing that you see, you see the increase in education over that same period, uh, which of course, if you think about study abroad, if you think about traveling abroad, if you think about uh, trips to museums, uh, education certainly has played place, uh, a critical role in that. So, in conclusion of this, and this is my last slide with text, uh, you can see that uh, we have a new status of cultural tourism. So the chronic, uh, the chronic fiscal stress that the governments developed during uh, the 70s and the quest for resources for economic growth shifted the city economy from a production-oriented to a consumption-oriented. But even though, as, but as I most, uh, noted a moment ago, uh, that consumption even has to be produced, uh, and thus the city is an entertainment machine. Right? Notice the entertainment machine, the machine part of it. So cases that, that drive for uh, production. And along with it, we see cultural industries or tourism become sources of economic growth. And we start to see cultural industries align with local economic and political elites, advocacy groups become very much part of it, and it become part of a new image. So the cities have to have cultural sport and tourism as part of their even their branding and as part of their quest for even global status. Uh, and their position within a hierarchy of, uh, which is again, I mean, to bridge and driven by competition. Now, along with it, we see what happens with tourism. Uh, tourism from the 1950s on, as you look forward, you see how much tourism has grown. It's, uh, it's not only in the United States, but across the globe. Uh, and uh, you can see now how, uh, how the global nature of uh, travel, uh, the impact that that has with the coronavirus that we actually are observing right in front of us as people become very mobile. But again, Tourist arrivals have uh, uh, exploded, obviously, over the last 50 or so years. And of course, along with it comes the power of travel, because as people visit, they are expending resources, and uh, that in turn starts to have a tremendous impact on the economy as a whole, and it starts to be viewed, be viewed as an economic development strategy. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go through some examples along the way that touch upon all the different areas. So this is Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania, one of the cities that has received a lot of attention. But if you look at Pittsburgh, and I don't think you see my arrow, you can see that there's been an enormous amount of interest in terms of creating an infrastructure here around the sport. Uh, so here you have the Children's Museum, you have a stadium over here that is for uh, Heinz Field, and that's for the Pittsburgh Steelers. You have another stadium over here. Can you see my arrow, by the way? Yes. yes. Okay. So you can see over here, this is for the Pittsburgh Pirates. 
And then uh, there's also uh, another museum over here. So Pittsburgh actually has looked, yeah, and this is a city that has experienced significant, uh, you know, a clear marker in terms of uh, in industry and manufacturing. They're trying to redevelop or reposition its economy and looking at sport and tourism. Uh, I think there's a war, uh, war museum along the way too, but they've focused very much into creating this infrastructure that can come along the way with those cities. This is Dunedin in uh, New Zealand, and a lot of times what happens when cities are trying to come and get on the map or try to think it's a South Island, uh, 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 when they try to be, position themselves in competition, they look for things. So in this particular case, you can see a proposal uh, in the in New Zealand for to create a uh, rugby, indoor rugby uh, facility, uh, and uh, uh, as a way to put the South Island and the Eden back on the map as a more history of industry, uh, and as a result of it, or which you end up having, you start to see communities that are starting to experience stress and tension, as in this particular case, for residents. Uh, uh, who view that this actually starts to uh, have an impact on the, on the community, so they are they're opposing them in directions. This is actually the Inner Harbor in uh, Baltimore, a city that's uh, uh, one of the first cities actually to, to start to think about uh, the tourism strategy as a form of economic development. You can see here uh, Camden Yards uh, located, and of course over here there is a warehouse that uh, the designers of the facility in the first uh, baseball field or uh, baseball stadiums that were used to revitalize uh, uh, Baltimore, but they kept the warehouse here uh, as a way to project uh, the connection of the stadium to the city itself. Uh, and of course, if you go into here, you move into the inner harbor area, which has in, uh, been a lot of uh, uh, facilities that have been uh, aimed at attracting tourists and visitors, uh, uh, tall ships and, and, uh, and conventioneers, uh, and uh, trying to help Baltimore rebound again from the core around cultural leisure. This is Glasgow in Scotland. Uh, this is an example of a city that was, uh, and this is actually a museum uh, called the Armadillo. Uh, and Glasgow uh, was uh, the European capital of culture, and we decided to utilize the designation as the European capital of culture to project a very different image, a contemporary city, uh, just to depart from its history or its past as an industrial center uh, in Scotland, uh, and uh, to, uh, to, to utilize architecture and also utilize the designation of the European capital of culture to uh, project itself very differently. Similarly, this is Krakow in Poland, uh, and here you see uh, a city that also has utilized its European Capital of Culture designation uh, and uh, tried to uh, uh, project its cultural history and its cultural identity uh, to promote itself, uh, its heritage status, UNESCO heritage status. Uh, and uh, uh, very similar to Glasgow is just a good place here, obviously, to view this culture, leisure, entertainment, uh, uh, and the way to an image rather than as we just saw a bit ago with Glasgow using the designation to way to depart, enter into a new type of identity. This is Penang in Malaysia, Malaysia. And this is an interesting thing. Uh, it's a very, very attractive place for tourism, and the city used tourism quite extensively to uh, generate a revenue. Uh, but one of the challenges that emerged in Penang is that, uh, and often it happens with a lot of places, where in this case, Buddhist temples uh, have to open up to visitors and tourists uh, uh, to enter, basically, uh, and become part of the attraction. Unfortunately, that tends to put a tension between the residents and the tourists. This is another thing where we see a city that are trying to develop themselves around cultural tourism. This internal challenge that increases the internal strife or tension between the residents and the visitor. And this is just one example of that, uh, where people feel that the place is not for them anymore. Residents feel that the uh, location is not for them. 
This is uh, Sydney, Australia, uh, not over 40, you can see the ship, but more importantly with the Olympics, this is Darling Harbor, uh, where uh, in preparation uh, during the Olympics, the city uh, uh, invested quite extensively uh, in the harbor itself to prepare for visitors to the Olympic Games, which is another thing that tends to have cities be the Olympic uh, for, uh, uh, for infrastructure development, to meet the need around culture and, and tourism and to make places more attractive. This is probably, uh, this is actually beautiful in England. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the first uh, cities to try to use uh, uh, tourism, and of course we have the Beatles Museum here, uh, but uh, uh, this is the uh, Albert Dock in uh, Liverpool. And here the city actually, uh, and by the way, if you finish up, if you look at Albert Dock during the period, you're not going to be impressed, but nonetheless, uh, this was supposed to be a major part of an effort by the city to uh, revitalize, and again, another formerly uh, heavily industrialized city, uh, but again, utilize culture and leisure uh, to move in that direction. This is another example of a city that are running into a conflict. This is Montreal, this is Chinatown in Montreal. We look at it very close to the convention center. A lot of people would uh, visit, uh, visitors to the convention center, uh, would visit the Chinatown, to visit Chinatown here. Uh, and of course, while there may be good business uh, opportunities for the uh, local uh, community, it starts to generate a lot of stress and conflict between the residents and the visitors because people feel that uh, uh, the, uh, the community has been uh, becomes uh, second to the economic interests of uh, local businesses and, and again it's very similar here to some of the attention taking place. This is Stockholm and this is where you started to see some park, uh, parks or outdoor uh, this is an interesting example of, uh, of, uh, of a theme park that's embedded into the community in itself or uh, 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 inside this, uh, the uh, uh, residential neighborhoods. Uh, and again, an another effort to try to use, which we see that too, we see theme parks or, uh, that, that are aimed at attracting visitors and tourists uh, and sometimes very dense environments. Uh, you try to make it all happen within that environment. Uh, uh, in Athens, there's a district called Plaka, P-O-A-K-A, -A, which you see, uh, uh, the, uh, and it's actually the most visited uh, district in Athens, because every tourist that visits their property will visit Plaka. And, and here's what you start to see places around the globe that tend to have contested uh, environments. But here you have the Byzantine uh, uh, church, and then you have the Acropolis, uh, or you have, a, and then you have neoclassical architecture. So you have a residential community that's embedded inside this multiple representations of culture, historically driven, and the notion that all of those things coexist as uh, visitors or to the community itself. And you have these various period, historical periods of all coming together. What may be the most ultimate example of uh, representation in Las Vegas, you can see here uh, the, the, the presentation of a place that uh, represents various aspects around the globe uh, and uh, uh, it's itself a lot of, a lot of places uh, as a tourist city, a lot of places would like to emulate the success from Las Vegas. We've already years have seen the expansion of the airport and obviously not tourism numbers, but of course the city that looked at different ways to position and present itself uh, to depart from a from a history, uh, you know, uh, the the marketing effort to continuously keep it fresh. And uh, there was an effort in the 90s and 2000s to attract family to Las Vegas. And apart from that, uh, our historical context, of course, the food stuff that has grown. Uh, there's been an interesting book uh, on uh, Terry, uh, you may remember, um, Mark Gutheimer's book on, uh, uh, I think it's called uh, Las Vegas, the Old American City, or something like that. The argument basically is that here's got a place that projects itself as a tourist place, but at the same time, when you look at Las Vegas, 
uh, uh, the, I think it's called the production of an American city or something, but uh, older book. But, but the argument is there that it's totally the same issue that a lot of other cities are dealing with, uh, and that is uh, you know, sprawl and uh, challenges with education and crime. Nonetheless, the city protects itself, and the imagery is around uh, the, the tourism industry and the success surrounding that. The bird's nest is another example of, uh, uh, of an effort to try to utilize these images of, uh, around the Olympics, but also tourism, just to push the envelope basically very much. And of course, some of the parents that emerge from that, which is one of them is how do you, what do you do with the facilities following the, uh, following the end of the games. And in this particular case, uh, uh, part of it has been converted into, uh, at least at some time after, we're converted into a mall, uh, and then uh, tours. So if you have a challenge, it's a global challenge uh, with, the, with Olympic Games, how are the facilities going to be used? while well, tourism becomes a, a driver for the city and a person this particular case for the nation. And then we run into some places. This is the I-4 over in Orlando, where you do have obviously Disney as being a major attraction, but if you start to look closely at what's taking place there, there's a whole other secondary tourist attraction uh, around uh, that includes the Orlando Premium Outlet Mall, the National Drive. So instead of going to Disney, uh, a lot of people choose actually to take a vacation outside Disney and in many ways kind of meet their needs for, uh, for a visitor experience without having to be part of what or Disney is known for. So there's a whole other economy and, and a whole other area around that. This is Copenhagen and, and here you see a number of our cities to new culture and, and this particular museum. Uh, the tribe will not line uh, uh, an ailing uh, 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 dock area uh, and, and uh, significant investments in use of anchors uh, to, uh, to redevelop and, and utilize again culture and user and tourism of the form. In some cases, this is Bogota, Colombia, uh, which actually has uh, some kind of credit tourism as, as a way of bringing Bogota or back from uh, uh, some of its historical challenges with crime and, 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 uh, uh, and to actually now becoming an, uh, a place to be visited because of its uh, unique uh, architecture and culture and history. Uh, and and Wagata is an example of the city that utilizes that, those attributes to project its style uh, and, and try to build a new identity uh, and divorce itself from, uh, uh, from its past. Another piece of infrastructure that has uh, been also in the forefront has been stadium development. A lot of cities use stadium and sports are the way to advance a new identity or uh, redevelop themselves. This is at the Coors Field in Denver. Uh, and when you construct it, they utilize brick and, uh, and steel. Uh, in the in Lodo or low downtown area, uh, and in many ways, if you can see here, here's downtown Denver. So you can see the facility where it was built. One of the one of the strategies there was to discourage parking around the area, so forcing people to work into lower downtown uh, and into the area. And if you visit the area, you'll find out that their whole neighborhood has emerged around it with families and residents that are now battling the challenge of traffic. And, uh, and, and, the, and the desire to maintain uh, a distinctive neighborhood feel and protect the area from those challenges. This is Cleveland, Ohio, a city that has also looked at sport to try to, in the other West, to revitalize itself. If you look at this, you can see obviously what was originally constructed as Jacob Steel, uh, which is in, uh, in, for baseball. But you can see a, 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 an indoor facility for the uh, for the Cleveland Cavaliers, and out here uh, a stadium for the Cleveland Browns. So an effort on the part of the city to focus in the downtown area and utilize uh, building development to re redevelop itself. And of course, in Chicago, the United Center, uh, which in some ways could be used as a barrier, as an older product. Uh, between uh, uh, near the near side and East Garfield Park and West Garfield Park to the west, 
uh, and of course the Eisenhower Expressway, the Medical Center, uh, the uh, elevated train, the metro train over here. Uh, but sometimes certain ways uh, are, are, are utilized, uh, at least conceptually, as a way to try to create uh, serve as uh, physical, physical boundaries. And there's a lot of examples. This is Portland, Oregon, and I think uh, all of us have come across where where you have uh, art display or uh, various types of festival. This is an interesting one. This is actually the Galapagos. Uh, here we have a tourism that's used for our uh, initiative for protecting um, uh, and it's a, it's a vital source for maintaining the natural uh, habitat uh, and control tourism. At the same time, in uh, uh, the Galapagos, you find the presence of an Italian restaurant. Uh, and, and you can start to see I guess, this conflict or this uh, as to how can uh, the stress or this pressure for uh, individuals that are open up businesses in places that obviously needs to be protected. Uh, this is uh, uh, this is actually I'm trying to remember here. This is uh, uh, in Australia. Uh, I'm trying to remember what's the name of the city here. Uh, this is a city actually that, that uh, aggressively identified the creative class, uh, Brisbane. This is Brisbane, Australia. Uh, and if you look a little bit into Brisbane, Australia, it's an effort on the part of the city uh, uh, to try to position itself as an att att attractive location for the creative class, what they consider to be creative class. So they put a lot of investment into parks and uh, 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 to, to bring in Visitors, which is the other visitors, but actually resident, which is another interesting orientation there. There are a lot of places around the country, including uh, the Gasland District in San Diego, and you see this district that are trying to become revitalized and redevelop around tourism and, and they become uh, uh, visitor centers and visitor economies, uh, part of the visitor economy. Our theaters in San Diego and the Stadium uh, and uh, Petco Field, I think. All the, and, and then and you have uh, uh, kind of moving people around within that environment, trying to revitalize the core. Another thing is just Cleveland, Ohio, but here is where you see an effort on the part of cities to redo in the private sector to redo lost living, and looking at warehousing and try to convert those and aggressively uh, uh, engage the uh, uh, residents into moving back into reconstituted places that are uh, certainly very, very, uh, uh, you know, geared towards young population, artists, and uh, 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 to be focused. This is, this is Nashville in Tennessee, which has undergone a tremendous amount of growth, uh, but a lot of times, uh, you know, greenery and, and uh, uh, creating spaces that become attractive for both residents and, and visitors along the way. This is a photo, I don't care if you've seen this one here, but this is actually a, uh, this, uh, this is in Chicago, this is Wabash, and this is an effort by the city, uh, I was going to say this is part of urban beautification, this is an effort by the city, this is a Boston uh, farm, in an effort to make the elevated train, or underneath the elevated train, Wabash more attractive, the proposal there was to create, uh, or to plant a, 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 a greenery, Hostage hedges that were upside down, then really would connect to each other, so that that would create a more attractive uh, uh, over your head or under the elevated train environment. Uh, cities like Savannah, Georgia, that utilize a very elaborate waterfront or riverfront area of warehouses to convert those into housing and, uh, and, uh, um, and shops, restaurants. And try to bring people along the, the, uh, this, the, the city or a very attractive place. Actually, I'm only about a couple hours away from this uh, city, which is a uh, couple hours away, and a really very unique historical uh, city. In fact, actually, it's the largest historic district in the United States, which is very, very surprising, but really very, very unique. We also have this, man, we also have this happening in smaller cities. This is Greenville, South Carolina, and here's a city that is using its river. Uh, and if you look a little bit to Greenville, Greenville, South Carolina, you find out that its, uh, its economy has, been, has unfolded and became an attraction for many, many uh, uh, residents uh, find it uh, uh, 
and the city has grown quite extensively over uh, the existing places. And here's Amsterdam, and sometimes you see these, these contradictions uh, that exist between the height of the story, and, and then of course you have a hot dog stand uh, right on the side. And the university village was, uh, was actually caused a bit of stress in some places where some of the challenges that are faced with uh, many of this uh, project is the impact of displacement and gentrification uh, that uh, the next two follows. Uh, of course, Chicago has extensively focused on urban beautification. I've written a little bit about urban beautification from the roofs to planters that cause accidents to, again, Grand Park and in various parts of Michigan Avenue. Uh, it's kind of significant effort in that, in that, in that regard. And of course, the infrastructure in Chicago from the museum campus uh, to the uh, expansion of the forming place, uh, the elimination of uh, uh, mixed field uh, and the rise of a park, uh, and of course the redevelopment of, of the uh, of Soldier Field, which was at the time uh, part of the rationale was to continue to bring people into into the uh, lakefront. And along with it, along with these efforts comes public art. Uh, this is something that was some years ago, couches. Uh, throughout the loop, and this was a public art exhibit underneath the daily. Uh, as, uh, you can see various forms of it as a form of public art to attract and the cows on parade, which is another very successful uh, 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 public art exhibit uh, in the loop, uh, where various cows were exhibited, um, and uh, it added a whole other dimension to the city in terms of its uh, imagery and, and uh, uh, invisibility. The Earth Globe, it's another public art exhibit uh, in Chicago on the lakefront, and many of these globes present various themes of uh, environmental protection. Uh, as you can see, all the, all the globes along in uh, the museum campus area. The city is also used on the car uh, to attract uh, and to uh, make place it more visible. This is actually, uh, it's actually an uh, overlaid sort of election drive in Bob. This is a, uh, as you can see, the architect is down here on this bridge. Uh, and as you enter the bridge, uh, you find out that uh, it's an opportunity along the wall to project various parts of the history of the city. You can see here the Great Chicago Fire, uh, Century of Progress, uh, and uh, uh, so, so far, culture and entertainment also be part of it. And the project that uh, you've probably come across, the Lending Park in Chicago, that started out as a $70 million to $100 million project, uh, ballooned to $500 million. I talked about this in the very beginning, half a million dollars, which uh, has been a highly successful attraction, a part of public partnership along the way. Well, in conclusion, I'm trying to stay within the time frame that uh, Professor Clark arrived me. Uh, tourism has become the merits of the mass phenomenon after the Second World War. It has been embraced as an uh, alternative economic development strategy. And when you look at tourism, you can identify quite a few, obviously, positive elements, but quite a lot of negative ones. Some of them relate to gentrification uh, and displacement. Uh, Sometimes there is stress and tension around uh, uh, interactions with uh, local residents. I think Charleston is another city that comes to mind where residents and, and the city are struggling. Uh, there's all the tools in the residential development because uh, reference professor Clark again, energy private growth, some of his work there, where amenities serve a very important part. But it, all these things are not just for the tourists, are also become very attractive elements for the visitors, I'm sorry, for the residents. Residents are attracted because of the amenities. And then obviously you see that not only government at the very bottom is involved in it, but also communities become involved in it and, and the tension as we look uh, we move forward. So uh, as you can see here, it is uh, it is something that has come to redefine tourism, it's come to redefine quite extensively the way uh, the New York cities are thinking about themselves and uh, the way that they are uh, uh, re revitalizing and positioning themselves in a new, uh, a new economy. Uh, so, let me see here. Okay. Thank <laughs> you.
execution. No, no. You can't? No. Okay, you can't. So anyway, so that's what I have to share with you. Uh, I don't know if anybody has any questions. Any questions or any comments or any thoughts? Did any of this resonate with anybody in terms of your um, your work or your interest or your travels or what you've observed? Can I ask about the night time? Oh, uh, yeah. I, uh, Do you want to go over there? Yeah. Uh, so the, yeah the student's going to come up to the front, so, okay. so maybe you, you can you can see him on the computer that's standing there. That then, otherwise he can't see you at all. So that, that yeah. that's a good idea. It's good, maybe, why don't you t talk to for, for two minutes about what you're doing in, in, in Beijing, so, so he has yeah. that as background. Okay. Uh, can you see me okay? Uh, can you see me? Hi. Uh, no, no, we still don't see yeah. him on the screen. Can, can you see him? I can see him, but you cannot see me. Can you see me? No, I can't see you. We, it only says that it has your initials, so it's pointed on you, but we don't see your face. Okay, so let me speak here. I'm trying to... Uh, yeah, now. Okay. Yes. No, oh, that, yes. That, now now we see it. Wonderful. Good. Hi. Okay. Hi. Uh, I'm a uh, master's student here at uh, Chicago. Uh, and I'm doing a uh, project on nightlife and how that connects to uh, scene theory and amenities. Um, and I'm going to try to uh, apply it to China, especially looking at Beijing and, and sort of uh, so deciding sort of other cities to involve in. But um, I'm, I was really interested in. Uh, uh, what you said about tourism, I think that's it's a definitely a big part of how nightlife has been developed and been proposed up in China. Because people are talking about like how to, if for example, in Beijing, there's been uh, almost 13 measures for developing nightlife in the city, and uh, some of them are directly uh, like building up sort of Beijing uh, cultural IDs or Beijing like specific like cultural identities, so as people from other places can come to Beijing and. Uh, come to these spots and say, well, I've been to this place, I've been to that place. Uh, but I mean, it looks like that resonated with a lot of what you said about sort of uh, reshaping or sort of revigorating a city's identity in terms of culture and how it's sort of turned manufacturing oriented city into a, a cultural ID in a lot of ways. But I mean, that, I mean, that is a work in progress. And I'm wondering sort of what your thoughts on sort of the process. I mean, like, how do you do that eventually to, to push forward that identity because a lot of that is visible to the residents because there are changes that are happening around them. But what about to uh, say like people from other cities or tourists around the world? Maybe I'm not sure social media what it means, but yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think you're absolutely right. Obviously, as you can see in this, there's a lot of different parts that are contributing to creating the tourist city. So uh, things like infrastructure are there necessary and from different forms of infrastructure. There's a street culture aspect of it that contributes to that. As you indicated, nightlife is like the only important role. And sometimes nightlife is something that emerges organically, or sometimes it's actually reduced. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in some cases, even uh, the role that ethnic neighborhoods, I, I think in that book I talk about different types of districts. Uh, ethnic district being one of, uh, type of it, uh, sports district another one. I think I have a typology of about if I remember correctly, eight or nine different districts or, or ways that contribute to creating a tourist city, or, or I suspect there will be many more. But I would agree with you, I think that nightlife is a, is a considerable or portion or element that can contribute that, uh, you know, into this. So that's interesting. It's an interesting research project. I wonder how, I guess, uh, you know, how nightlife. Uh, evolves or changes depending upon various pressures and or to what extent maybe uh, 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 how, how it unfolds over time depending upon uh, various uh, sometimes uh, organic or sometimes planned mm -hmm. uh, efforts along the way. I, I agree with you. I think there's something you said there about the relation to your nightlife and its contributions to creating a tourist city. I would say that you know, there in Chicago, obviously Chicago has developed more of a nightlife, but, but, but in terms of the downtown area or associated with the infrastructure there, very interesting. You know, that, 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 that I, would, I would agree with your assessment there. Okay, thank you. Thank um, you. Yeah.
Yeah, because uh, like thinking about China too, because that, that, that's something that I've um, encountered in my research is China has a lot of regional variations, and nightlife, mm -hmm. as you said, could be a very organic thing. It could be originating from the community itself. There's a nighttime mm -hmm. culture that maybe in Latin America is much more evident. Uh, but the, the thing is in China, uh, when the country sort of in, embarks on this um, policy initiative to promote nightlife almost everywhere, it, even in uh, Beijing, uh, which is a northern city that doesn't traditionally have too much nightlife as, as compared to say like Shanghai or Guangdong, um, it, it has some problems in terms of um, do we how, how do we sort of turn that um, normally organically generated form of uh, uh, lifestyle and how do we sort of use examples from other cities to sort of build infrastructure amenities that you know convince people that going out at night is is, is, is good and it's safe and it's, uh, and it's entertaining and, and I think that is uh, mm -hmm. what, what you said about sort of how to construct versus how uh, uh, how a place or a scene is uh, sort of original in its sense is you know from its historical uh, cultural backgrounds uh, right. that is an issue that yeah. yeah and and you know what really is about a month ago I was in Taipei and it's interesting how we do have an essence of nightlife or neighborhood or connectedness here in the city uh, but then but then you have something like uh, you know, think about Navy Pier in Chicago for example like a different type of but, but again, less organic, but much more forced, or much more, uh, you know, uh, some, of the, some of the older cities that tend to have as part of the culture and part of the identity, or if you go to Latin America, for example, it's part of life, part of everyday living, and then you have that entrusted in something that's much more structured or organized or forced upon, which can be successful or not successful, because, like, for example, Navy Pier has gone from Chicago, has gone through a lot of periods of success, and the city's always trying to refresh it in many ways. So it's interesting to think about how certain things work very well with that and other, other cultures, you have more of a difficult time making it happen. Absolutely. Yeah. Good observation. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Another student. Okay, thank you. Go up to the front so you can see Hey, Professor. Hey, yeah, how are you? Good, how are you? Thank you Good. for your presentation. Um, so my question, uh, essentially, you know, you gave some of the, some of the reasoning behind or, uh, how cities uh, essentially are actors in, in sort of like a, be, being catalytic in terms of like implementing these new touristic structures. But what about when the city, uh, when their plan is, seems nonsensical. And uh, some of the examples that I'm thinking about is, for instance, like in San Francisco, the demolishing of Candlestick Park and then putting it in Santa Clara, um, mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, closer to the to that fan base where, I'm, you know, probably don't live there anymore either because it's unaffordable. But then in the mm -hmm. same place, you know, like the new Warriors Stadium in Mission Bay, where it's like a, large medical district, you know, it's sort of maybe the clash of traffic there. Um, so I was wondering if you could speak. Yeah, yeah. I think I think you're gonna identify an, on the stadium development issue. Your first name is Guillermo. Guillermo Guillermo? Guillermo. Guillermo, Guillermo. So uh, I mean it's interesting when you look at stadium development as a as a for security the history of stadium development in the United States for example, if we're gonna focus on that. You start out with facilities, if you look at like, uh, so I mentioned earlier, if you look at uh, uh, Fenway Park, and if you think about the old Kermiski Park, and if you think about uh, uh, um, like uh, Old Tiger Stadium, like I'm talking about Wrigley Field, I'm talking about facilities built from 1910 to about 1920, those were embedded into the neighborhood in many ways because of the nature of the market. So it's very, very possible for one to drive down and then miss it. That's how embedded the neighborhood was. Yeah. So then after the Second World War, we go into a period where uh, there was the rise of the suburban uh, facility in some ways. Because with decentralization and suburbanization, teams started to 
desire to move back to go where their ticket holders were. And then we started to see facilities like Veteran Stadium or Field in Philadelphia, which is kind of located outside. Uh, you start to see uh, across the country the suburban ballpark, along with the comps, the dome facilities. You start to see uh, uh, multi-use facilities. So you have Three River Stadium in Pittsburgh that was for baseball and for football at the same time. Riverfront Stadium in Cincinnati that was for uh, baseball and for football. Uh, you start to see domes like 1970 where you have the uh, the uh, the, uh, the dome in, uh, I'm trying to remember all the names right here in Detroit. Uh, it wasn't the Super Dome, but it was the uh, Silver Dome. Silver Dome, I think. So you start to have a lot of that large multi purpose. Then when we started getting the 80s and the 90s, in the 90s, we started to see the stadium becoming part of downtown. We started to see the shifting back into the core. And I mentioned earlier in Baltimore, for example, uh, when well, I was in downtown stadium, the first one with Jacobs Field, Coors Field, 95, there's an effort to go back. Now what we start to see now, so we've graduated from that, and now what we're entering in, we're entering the new era, interestingly enough, and the new era is the sports facility not necessarily tied into a location that is suburban or urban, or as an economic development force, but rather position uh, around other amenities. Mm. So I think uh, there's some interesting examples of that. So, uh, for example, the Atlanta Braves are moved to outside the city, yep. and now it's actually where baseball, it so happens to be just one part of the experience because there are restaurants, but the whole thing is, is all artificial, it's all part of. Uh, I think the same thing happens in downtown Los Angeles. You start to see the construction of new facilities uh, with hotels and restaurants and shopping that it so happens that sport is part of it. When you go from something that's very focused and very specific over the years, maybe the multi-purpose use, that kind of a thing, to actually something that now is part of a larger agenda that is really, I mean, you enter there and you can watch sports, but you can also shop, and you can also stay overnight, and you can actually go to uh, various other attractions. I think that's the new trend that we start to see with new construction, more like complexes, mm -hmm. uh, rather than just, again, the facility itself. And if you actually look a little bit closer, you find that the facility, again, is part of a larger agenda uh, that complements that, whether that's, in some cases, they start to move outside the core because you don't have the space for that, so you start to see that shift of taking place to accommodate it. I think in uh, Los Angeles, what is it, Inglewood, which uh, you probably know better than I do, I guess there's a new stadium for the uh, Los Angeles, the Rams, right? I think if, you, if one starts to look closely to some of the more recent projects, the Chargers, the Chargers, the Chargers, not the Rams, right? The Chargers, I think once you look closely, you'll find out that they're bothered, a much different strategy, uh, not necessarily urban, but rather uh, consumption driven, consumption oriented, uh, and, uh, and and I think that's how stadium development has evolved. Uh, uh, a different type of economic development, a different type of uh, different type of urban development, I guess, but much more driven around consumption. Not to say, but again, remember now yeah. when we had to really feel the thinking of not around consumption, obviously, but when we get to uh, luxury skyboxes and things like that in the 80s and 90s, and then now it's just on steroid, basically, the consumption aspect of it. Yeah, that, that's a really fascinating uh, facet of this whole narrative that the creation of these kind of like, uh, as you mentioned, you know, it, it's pretty much like uh, all based around consumption and not necessarily um, kind of this authentic demand. It's all like, you know, manufactured. As you're saying. Exactly. And then in some cases, you go to some of these facilities and it's almost like a mall atmosphere yeah. um, rather than just, uh, and it so happens that the sport is just taking place. But you, you, could, you could be entertained without even being interested in the sport itself. Wow. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, thank you so much. Appreciate your comment and your thought. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, listen, you should, you should ask a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. Talk about your project. Uh, we have we have uh, 
a student walking up from the back who's doing a very interesting EA on, on sports in the South, as you're now in the South, uh, Pastor, mm -hmm. so let him, let him talk. Hello. Yeah. Hi there. Uh, my name is Teddy. Um, I'm from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, so I'm doing a project on LSU football specifically. Uh, okay. And I saw that in your presentation you mentioned Greenville. Uh, I was partly wondering if you'd looked at like Clemson or any of the um, South Carolina universities around there, and um, their like what their cities are do what like these college teams are doing with their massive college stadiums. And if you've looked at any of like the tinier towns, maybe Tuscaloosa or mm -hmm. Baton Rouge or um, Gainesville or to any of these other town, like tinier southern towns, because that's what I'm interested in, because that's where I'm from. Yeah, yeah. I have not, and that's why I think that you're into this, because that's a good project to work on, because I'll say I haven't done this, I haven't, I haven't been, but you're absolutely right, if somebody has moved from Chicago to the south, and I've lived here for about eight years, seven, seven years now, uh, it's interesting to recognize how big football, college football is. I mean, it's just, there's, unless you're here, you don't really, like as I said, in LSU, Baton uh, Rouge, and Clemson, and Athens, and uh, and Gainesville, and all those places. Uh, and, or uh, I guess you know, I go occasionally to Columbia for South, you know, University of South Carolina, and all that for various. Uh, just go there in the fall, but uh, it's it's or or Knoxville. That's another example there of a major major place. Yeah, I haven't really looked into that. I don't know. I don't know how much work has been done in those and, and what those mean for the local. Of course, some of these places are, are growing and getting bigger. I think Knoxville, I think, would be an example of it. Obviously, Columbia, Columbia to South Carolina, um, uh, but uh, uh, as Gainesville did. But again, here you're looking at college towns that are on um, steroids, and they're certainly uh, you know major attractions. So I, I haven't really looked into that, but it'd be very interesting. For you to work on that project, and I'd be more than happy to find out your work and how that unfolds. I'm having fun so far working on it. Yeah, yeah, that's good stuff. It's an original view. Yes, yeah. thanks. Okay. Well, Costas, we're delighted to have had you here and that things worked out 98% perfectly in terms of the technical part and 110% in terms of the content. So. Thank you as ever for being original, bringing us new ideas, and, and then thinking from the standpoint of, of the Beijing nightlife, what you heard the question on, Beijing has really got a, a massive kind of program of new transit, new required or subsidized hours for certain restaurants, hotels, bars, clubs, other facilities to try to spur more nightlife. In, in a sense, the, the, the theme which is interesting in part is how the traditions of the South honor, respect, hierarchy, patriotism, link with the military and with a regional culture which is more heightened elements of, for instance, high school marching bands, um, mm -hmm. which are used as well at the intermissions of, of the mm -hmm. football games. I mean, these right. things feed together in ways that are more historically um, organic in ways that are different from the image that it's all constructed from the outside. But if it, even if it's constructed at one time, if you don't pay close attention to what the consumption, the consumers will, will, will come to participate in and enthusiastically support, and then tourists will come that is in Chicago, I've had many meetings with tourist folks, and they say, we try to do it in a way that it will work for Chicago residents, and if they're enthusiastic, that will engage the tourists as well. That's the opposite of the idea that tourism is just for a global, homogeneous set of people on a bus, and that, right. they, and that they don't come from anywhere. But the, to integrate the values of, the, of, the, of tourists as well as local, different participants in different neighborhoods articulating different Greek town versus mm -hmm. Chinatown versus Boys Town, and Boys Town right next to uh, <laughs> football, baseball, etc. The, these combinations of, in the Chicago neighborhoods provide a window to the world as both you have illustrated and I've tried to articulate for, to, for students to explore. So. Thank you yeah. for showing it so specifically, and we look forward to seeing how how you how you elaborate this uh, 
as your travels continue, and you've, you've enlightened us substantially. And, and remember as well the books, which he, um, in the main, the one book on tourism, but also the, the new book, which is in more, much more detail on how Daly did this in Chicago. He didn't really talk about the book. The, the, this is the, his, one of his newest books. Plus, he has a book called St. Charles, Illinois, where he lived for a number of years. So how a, a suburban, interesting location also has a distinctive cultural style that makes things work for it. So thank you, Costas. Thank you, Terry, very much. Thank you for the opportunity. It was wonderful to, 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 be, to be with you and see you. And I look forward to seeing you when I come up there again soon. OK. Bye -bye. Thank you, Terry. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. OK, we have two student presentations. What, um, who's, who, who's, um, who are they? Great. All right. Yeah, actually, uh, yeah, so now you're both on sports, so that, that's yeah, perfect. So why don't you let you come, come on and, and continue from what you did. Teddy, the yes. floor is yours. Okay. Yeah, do you? topic, I guess. Uh, for this presentation, I kind of go into my research question, my case, uh, some details about my case, uh, the connections to this class that I talked about um, to Professor Clark about uh, over two years now, and then my current research plan. And so this map right here is pretty much shows the location of every major college football team in the country. Uh, it might be a little outdated, but as you see, there's a big concentration in the South and the Midwest. And California isn't really relevant anymore, unfortunately. So um, my research question in general is I'm trying to look into the relationship between college football programs and their host communities. So um, and why is this relevant? So it, it looks like college football is just this kind of tiny, it's kind of tiny money-wise compared to the major professional sports leagues. I mean, the NFL is worth $13 billion, and uh, college football made the NCAA, which is the body in charge of it, um, roughly $32 million. It owed last year, I believe that's what these numbers are from. But the big point though is that college football is an amateur sport, so the athletes don't make any money. So all that money is going somewhere else, not the athletes. And um, these communities where college football is massive tend to be very tiny communities. So I'm very interested in the effects that these massive money makers have on these tiny communities that are typically pretty rural in the South. So now my particular case is Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Because I grew up in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I love LSU. It, it's just great. It works out perfectly. So Baton Rouge is state capital. LSU was the 2019-20 national champions, which I'm actually really excited about because I think that that will help me with my research. Because I can just look into all these proposed impacts of winning a championship on a school too. Uh, and then LSU is also the second most successful team over the last two decades if we're counting success by championships, because we have three. Fortunately, University of Alabama has five. And again, um, I'm employed, I am also an employee for LSU. I work in data analytics for the athletic department. So I happen to be well, pretty well connected. Um, my mother was a professor at LSU for a while in the music department. And uh, so she's connected to professors that I can interview for this research project. And my father has worked in the service industry in Louisiana his whole life. So I also have service industry contacts. So I just happen to be pretty well located to do some pretty holistic research into this case. And so this is just, uh, I'm trying to illustrate a point about money here. This is a map I love. Every, sit, every single state in red, the highest paid public employee is the head football coach at a public university. Every single state in blue, the highest paid uh, public employee is the head basketball coach at a public university. So as you can see, that's the vast majority of the country. 
And Louisiana is right there in red. Our football coach, highest paid public employee. I just think this is really fascinating, and I think that the fact that not a lot of, of research seems to have been done into this phenomenon is kind of disturbing, and that's part of my impetus for research. Moving on, our football coach, Ed Ogeron, he's really cool, in part because he's from Louisiana. This is him. This is a Mardi Gras float made in his likeness with him holding dead bird, dead ducks that represent teams that we beat last season. We're really into him because he's a cultural hometown figure. I'm really interested in how he, as a cultural figure, impacts the team and how he might impact the relationship because he's a Cajun. He's from, he's a swamp person, basically. It's cool. Louisiana doesn't see a lot of swamp people rise to major positions of authority anymore. We really like that. I'm really interested in how um, he, how he, as kind of a cultural and emotional core of the relationship between the program and the community, operates. Ideally, this summer, I'll get to actually interview him and see uh, what he views. But in interviews so far, what, what I noticed watching as many interviews with him as possible is that he constantly equates the team with the state. So in, in his character, you see the physical embodiment of Louisiana representing the football team. And in his words, you hear that, that, that same sentiment repeated. I just think that's very fascinating and interesting for the sake of my research. Now moving on to the community. So Baton Rouge is located right there. And at the far right, yeah, that's our football stadium. Tiger Stadium seats 102,321 people. That is the seventh largest sports stadium in the world and the sixth largest college football stadium in the world. The only stadium that's larger than a college football stadium in the world is in North Korea. All the other large stadiums, pretty much every other stadium that seats over 100,000 people is an American college football stadium, which is pretty crazy. It's kind of surprising that more research hasn't been done into that phenomenon, especially because Baton Rouge is only home to 200,000 people. So roughly half of Baton Rouge can fit in that football stadium. In fact, that football stadium is, would be the sixth largest city in the state of Louisiana if it were just a city of 102,000 people. That kind of, I think that that illustrates pretty clearly just how big and important LSU football is for the state. Just from pure numbers standpoint. That's ridiculous. And then in the middle, you see Coach Ogeron holding hands with the current governor of Louisiana, a Democrat, John Bell Edwards. And it's pretty shocking that Louisiana has a Democratic governor. Edwards, in his re-election campaign this year, was endorsed by our football coach. And the other guy, the Republican, was endorsed by Donald Trump. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that Ogeron is more popular than Trump is in Louisiana. The other guy had other baggage. He was from a part of the state that isn't very popular. He probably was, he wasn't going to be able to get the swing voters to vote, probably. But I think this just continues to serve to to illustrate my point that LSU football is this very unique entity in Louisiana. Politically, culturally, emotionally, population, just pure numbers wise. But economically, it's ridiculous. Also, Donald Trump went to two college football games this year. They were both LSU football games. I was at one of them, the national championship game, which is where the photo on the far right was from, and it was insane. It felt like I was at a Donald Trump rally. Uh, everyone else in there was cheering very happily and loudly for Trump. I had never, I had never been to a political rally before, so I, I assume that that's what political rallies feel like. So that sort of national connection, I think, is also rather fascinating. The whole top-down, how Trump chose college football after being booed at a world, at a baseball World Series game. It's almost like he chose college football as the sport that, hey, it looks like these fans actually do reflect the um, the electorate that voted for me. I just think that's fascinating to bring up. So what is, and finally, the connection to the class? So first, there's the idea that Louisiana is the hotbed of Chicago-style clientelism, um, where it, based on, I actually thought of this while we were, uh, during class lecture, when we, when we were doing the new, I think the new, new Chicago School slides, that um, Daily One reminded me a lot of Huey P. Long, as this kind of like political machine figure in Louisiana politics. And also, something similar, Louisiana is the only state with more federal indictments uh, for political corruption per capita than Illinois. In the period of, let's see, where's, uh, 1976 to 2010, I think that's the research from um, the UIC professor you pointed me towards. Dick, Dick Simpson. Dick Simpson, yes. Also, um, 
Louisiana politics and local trust. Uh, again, I don't necessarily have numbers to support this, but as someone who's lived in Louisiana his whole life, I can tell you that no one in Louisiana trusts the government. A big part of that is hurricanes, and a big part of that is corruption, because hurricanes are always handled poorly, and we know that we're super corrupt. I think the, that one could argue almost that there's more trust from the local populace in the football team and the head coach than there is in the actual government. And again, this is all the whole idea of trust and where the citizens place their trust, whether it's the government or in a cultural group or amenity like football. Also, again, I already made at this point about the gubernatorial election. So moving on to my research. So I, I'm planning essentially, because of my position and my connections, I'm hoping to use a sort of qualitative approach to inform a quantitative direction. I'm planning on interviewing as many people as possible once I get home within the department to see what they've, within the department, within business people my dad has friends with, professors, the co coaches, maybe college football players, even though I don't know how much access I can have of players during the summer, to try and get the feel for how as many different people in Baton Rouge in positions of influence and also just normal people, how they view the relationship between the team and the community. And then I'll use, I'll hopefully be able to use those interviews to inform a more quantitative direction, or I'll just have the interviews to use as my research. Um, similarly, I also thought of this idea, because uh, I'm, I'm taking sociological methods right now, I thought of this idea of using social media interactions, because LSU was very big into social media presence this season, uh, particularly Twitter. We posted a hype video before every single home game that was like narrated by a former player with insane production value and stuff. It was kind of crazy. I just I feel like Twitter. It's, this is millions of interact millions of interactions over the season. I know that you can't really do a like formal re formal research that way, but definitely I can kind of characterize the relationship through social media, or at least get a sort of um, building blocks to use to move forward. So this is kind of where I am right now. I have all this stuff that's my research. I'm, I mean, this is very much rudimentary, as everyone could probably tell. I, I just changed majors. I just started thinking about my BA thesis in the first place. So any questions or comments would be uh, very appreciated. city is affected by globalization, and specifically looking at the case study of the Houston Rockets. So our goal was to analyze the implications of the increasing international presence that the NBA has. So this can definitely be seen just the presence they're having in China specifically. And our hypothesis is that sports teams are facing increasing international pressure. So they're having to sort of balance these different standards that you have internationally of place like China as compared to the local regions where they are where we have a city. Absolutely. And for one of the, the most important factors of this is you have uh, interactions with uh, companies and sports teams with their communities and this has been in the form of Amazon's uh, HQ recently and the, the Las Vegas Raiders are another great case study of this. 
And one of the things we really want to look at was the impact of the stadium, whether that be culturally and economic, uh, as a way for cities to actually try to judge and determine uh, the value of hosting a team. So Chinese involvement in sports, the NFL, which is pretty surprising because you don't really hear much about it, according to an NFL MD named Richard Young, so a game director, four million people viewed the NFC Championship two years ago between the Rams and the Saints, and this was up 170% from the previous year. Uh, the NFL averages 18 million Chinese viewers weekly, with each game averaging 2.2 million viewers. And the slate in China for the game that they receive, there's three primetime games and one other game. So they usually get the teams that are like on Sunday night, Monday night, Thursday night football. And those are typically you know, bigger markets or bigger teams like Seattle Seahawks, Saints, etc. And the NBA, there's 300 million recreational basketball players in China. Basketball is very big in China. It's a huge market for them. 750 million plus unique viewers for the 2018 season. The NBA also signed a recent deal about a year -ish ago with uh, Tencent, a broadcasting company, media entertainment, for $1.5 billion. And this represents about 10% of the NBA revenue. One of the amazing things is, so China essentially has as many recreational basketball players in the US as people. Um, just to kind of give you the scale of the Chinese market. And so, in terms of globalization within the NBA, Chinese revenue is estimated to place it at least, like you said, 10% of NBA revenue. This is expected to be about 20% by 2030. As mentioned, they recently signed that broadcasting deal, and this puts teams in situations that we have, like, more recently with Daryl Morey and the Houston Rockets, where you're having to do this sort of balancing gap, where there's American free speech and there's Chinese censorship, and you're trying to figure out the middle ground. And these are just a bunch of statistics in terms of what we already talked about. So 37% of people under 30 in China are interested in the NBA. 25% um, over their 30s are interested in the NBA. Here we just have a bunch of numbers that we mentioned before with China's basketball players. Yeah, so that brings us to the case study of the Houston Rockets. So one of the things you see with the Houston Rockets is they're one of the most globalized teams by fan base in the entire NBA. Uh, Second only to San Francisco, the San Francisco uh, Golden State Warriors. And this is largely because uh, San Francisco has a very large Chinese population, around 21.5%. And Houston's fan base stemmed a lot from Yao Ming, uh, being one of the first well-known Chinese basketball players in the NBA. Uh, Daryl Morey recently had a tweet uh, where he said, uh, fight for freedom, stand with Hong Kong. And that led to a, a huge uh, negative response from the Chinese market, and that included, as uh, we see, Alibaba, Alibaba delisted every single Houston Rockets product in China. Uh, the NBA was under immense pressure from uh, inter internally to possibly uh, denounce uh, Daryl Morey's tweet. They ended up actually standing with free speech, but this is a, a perfect example of where we have American values of free speech uh, at at being directly uh, in, in contradiction with Chinese values of uh, respecting the state. Um, and one of the things that kind of speaks to the, the level of globalization, this is one of the Houston Rockets jerseys, uh, which has the, the Chinese uh, for the, the actual team name. And that kind of brings us to sports teams as cultural centers. So one of the things that we really see is uh, sports teams really are part of the community, and this is exactly what Professor Gossett was talking about, was that they, they bring in and inspire art, and they can bring in economic development. Uh, one of the things that teams often have to juggle when, when valuing teams, when valuing the incentives that they provide to teams, come in the form of, do teams generate positive economic growth in the city? And this is a very difficult thing to measure, and as, as you can imagine, there's a lot of economic consultants who can steer it in either direction. But, uh, Mark Rosentraub at Major, Major League Losers, I think Professor Clark recommended us too, speaks about how uh, the tourism from the actual teams is uh, typically economically negligible to the actual uh, cost of the team. So what you can imagine is uh, the, the huge incentives and the order of magnitude of the hundreds of millions that are provided to these teams uh, do not account for the, the taxes that they are brought in. 
So typically when they're determining the team, you get to look at the cultural value that they have. And what Mark goes on to say in uh, Major League Winners, uh, his follow-up book, was that these teams can bring a huge piece of uh, cultural development and can add so much to the grading of the creative class, which, is, which can uh, which could further, which, which could further complicate uh, the decision if a team is actually a, a positive economic decision. And this is seen in uh, the LeBron's mural when he came to LA. There's a huge cultural uh, uh, respect to him, and one of them uh, manifested itself in this. And kind of to Professor Constance's point about how teams are moving away from the city, this is the Cowboys Stadium, which, as you can see, is 30 miles outside of Dallas. Uh, and it's typically an area that no one would go to, but it has brought in a huge source of, uh, of commercial development in this region. Uh, it's un unclear if it's actually worth the cost of the stadium, um, but this is not only a piece of economic, uh, economic creation, but also of art with, uh, it's supposed to be beautifully designed if you're into architecture. Uh, yeah, any questions? Sir?